Is it too late to stop Turkey's military offensive in northern Syria, as the US president is criticised by all sides for allowing the operation to happen? Donald Trump sends his top envoys to ask Turkey for a ceasefire. Can a compromise be found? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Sahil Rahman. Donald Trump is trying to limit the fallout from Turkey's military offensive in northern Syria. The US president is being widely accused of allowing the operation to happen by withdrawing troops from there. Turkish airstrikes on Kurdish forces began last week, quickly followed by troops on the ground. The US House of Representatives delivered a bipartisan rebuke by overwhelmingly opposing Trump's pullout. He sent both the vice president and the secretary of state to Ankara to try and broker a ceasefire. Turkey's president insists he won't back down. Instead, Recep Tayyip Erdogan is urging Kurdish fighters to surrender. Our proposal is that right now, all the terrorists lay down their arms, their equipment and everything, destroy all their traps and get out of the safe zone that we have designated. When what we've described is done, from Manbij to the Iraqi border, then our Operation Peace Spring, which only targets terrorists, will end on its own. Donald Trump has given mixed messages since Turkish troops launched their offensive. The US president defended his decision to pull US forces out of northern Syria. He tweeted, It is time for us to get out of these ridiculous, endless wars. We will fight where it is to our benefit and only fight to win. Hours later, he backtracked, tweeting a warning to the Turks. If Turkey does anything that I, in my great and unmatched wisdom, consider to be off-limits, I will totally destroy and obliterate the economy of Turkey. I've done before. Well, Trump also wrote a warning to Turkey's president before the military action. He started the letter to Recep Tayyip Erdogan, suggesting that they could work out a good deal. Trump's tone soon changed, telling Erdogan that he could be remembered as a devil if the offensive went ahead, and warned, you don't want to be responsible for the slaughtering of thousands of people, and I don't want to be responsible for destroying the Turkish economy. Don't be a tough guy, don't be a fool. And there have since been more contradictory statements from the US leader. I have told Turkey that if they do anything outside of what we would think is humane, to use the word a second time. We talk about Hong Kong, we talk about this. Uh, they could suffer the wrath of a, an extremely decimated economy. Now, the Kurds are fighting for their land, just so you understand. They're fighting for their land. And as somebody wrote in a very, very powerful article today, they didn't help us in the Second World War. They didn't help us with Nor Normandy, as an example. Or we could mediate a deal between Turkey and the Kurds. I like that. You know, let's mediate a deal. We put the strongest sanctions that you can imagine, but they get a lot. We have a lot in store if they don't, uh, if they don't have an impact. Now, the PKK, which is a part of the Kurds, as you know, is uh, probably uh, worse at terror and more of a terrorist threat in many ways than ISIS. I'm not going to get involved in a war between Turkey and Syria, especially when, if you look at the Kurds, and again, I say this with great respect, they're no angels. Well, let's introduce the panel. Here in Doha, we have Ranj Aladin, the visiting fellow at the Brookings Doha Center. In Istanbul, Mithat Rende, a retired Turkish ambassador to Qatar. And in Maryland, in the US, via Skype, we have David Pollock, director of Project Fikra, a research program on the Middle East at the Washington Institute. Gentlemen, welcome to Inside Story. Uh, David Pollock, can I begin with you in the US? I mean, President Trump has been at odds with his own party officials for several months now and his international partners uh, in getting sort of his messages across a, range, across a range of policy ideas. But when it comes to the Kurds, when it comes to the issue of Syria, he, he really is uh, quite stuck at the moment. Yes, uh, he's opposed by uh, many uh, experts here in the United States, uh, including many important Republican political 
figures, even in the House of Representatives, as we saw in the vote there yesterday, rebuking President Trump or rejecting his withdrawal from Syria. I think uh, President Trump, based on the comments that he made yesterday in a meeting with senators, including and other uh, congressmen, including some of the Democrats who walked out of the meeting, mm. President mm. Trump still believes, apparently, that this is what he was elected to do, to bring U.S. troops home from the Middle East. Indeed. Uh, and the, the, the issue is, though, as well, is where's he getting his information to make such statements? I mean, he says one thing, the Pentagon, the CIA, CIA the Defense uh, Department uh, and, and the State Department all seem to be singing off different hymn sheets. Yeah, that, that's true about what's happening in Syria, but about what's happening here in the United States, uh, honestly, uh, I don't agree with this myself, but it is true that the American people as a whole, based on public opinion polls, are, have very mixed views about this. They're about evenly split on whether the United States should stay in Syria or not. OK, let's bring in uh, former Ambassador uh, Mithat Rende. Uh, good to have you with us, sir, from Istanbul. Uh, your president certainly has no contradictions. He's very clear on the matter. He knows uh, what he wants. He's stated his aims and objectives. Um, he obviously uh, is making it very clear where he stands. How is he going to react as Pompeo and Vice President Pence land in Ankara? Well, uh, pres the president is, is, is now meeting uh, the American delegation, uh, the Vice President uh, Pence and, 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 the, and the Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. Uh, I think uh, th this visit uh, is an important one. It's a kind of uh, preparatory uh, visit for the, uh, the, the planned visit uh, of the president to the United States on the 13th, 13th of November. And, uh, and, and probably they have, uh, they have been instructed to uh, put pressure on the Turkish establishment to stop uh, the operation. Uh, and it will be uh, a tough, uh, probably, meeting. But uh, it probably at this point I should I should remind that this operation started uh, for the with the aim of clearing the Turkish uh, and Syrian border from from terrorists and to prevent uh, the creation of a terror corridor. Indeed, and also to establish a, 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 a to establish a zone a free um, a safe zone so that uh, so that the, the Syrians refugees which are about three point five million. Uh, and and uh, people, they are registered. The registered are 3.5 million, but probably we have more than 5 million Syrians in Turkey. So some of them, at least one or two million people will be, the plan of Turkey is to move the people and to create the necessary environment, a conducive environment uh, in northern Syria and to, to move the people because it, it, it is not politically affordable Indeed. for any president or any establishment to keep 5 million Syrians and there is very little that the international community has Indeed. done so oh, far. What's your impression and your understanding of the way the Turkish government and president are thinking at the moment when it comes to a potential ceasefire? Is it possible? Well, you know, a ceasefire, a ceasefire is, 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 can, be, can be discussed between uh, legitimate, between two states. The other side, uh, the, the other side is YPG and, uh, and it is the affiliated organization of PKK, a terrorist organization. So. I don't believe that uh, that the Turkish side will accept to have a ceasefire uh, with with uh, such a non-state non actor, which is internationally recognized mm. uh, as a terror organization. So uh, I don't I don't I don't expect much from the meeting. Probably there will be some discussions about uh, the, the the future uh, meeting, as I said in, uh, in in Washington. I don't expect much from 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 the from the visit of, of Pence. They will have also. Uh, other bilateral meetings discussing defense-related issues and defense cooperation and so on. But to, uh, I don't believe that the, the Turkish side will be convinced to stop the operation at this point in time. 
Uh, can I bring in uh, Ranj Aladin in Doha? I mean, you've heard what the ambassador said, you know, that there is a very clear distinction as to what they believe the PKK are. There are, of course, the US and the EU have uh, deemed the PKK group um, uh, as a terrorist organisation. In terms of uh, Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo uh, arriving in Ankara, I mean, your general impression, I mean, what can they actually achieve? Can they make Ankara move in any direction that suits you might say President Trump's a very difficult position at the moment in Washington, D.C. Well, I think the, the ambassador is partly correct. What's effectively happened is a development of a momentum as a result of this incursion. Uh, so the idea that somehow you can achieve a secession of hostilities uh, just days into, an, into this operation uh, is implausible. Uh, I think it could still be weeks until that becomes a realistic scenario, uh, not least because President Erdogan has to actually save face if there was to be a secession of hostilities in the coming days or within the next week or so. Uh, I don't think that will play very well to his domestic audience. But I also think the ambassador is partly incorrect because in fact, Turkey has negotiated with the PKK before. It's negotiated, uh, engaged and also hosted uh, the YPG or its political wing, the PYD. So there is actually a possibility of negotiating, mediating a settlement of some sort to this conflict, whether it's short term, that I think is still something because it can create the breathing space for a lasting settlement. But ultimately, I think the whole thing needs a strategy. Uh, and if the United States is serious about, you know, ending this incursion, finding a settlement, achieving a secession of hostilities, there needs to be a strategy for that. And that hasn't really developed just yet. But most importantly, it hasn't really emerged or developed over the past number of years. Indeed. Uh, David Pollock, can I bring you in here? What do you think the strategy should be now that Mike Pence and Mike Pompeo are in Ankara and they do have the chance to talk to the higher echelons of government? Well, I think that the United States is focused, first of all, on trying to find a ceasefire or some way at least to reduce the level of hostilities. I agree that it's very difficult politically right now to make that happen. At the same time, the Turkish government has stated that once its objectives are achieved, that it will be prepared to stop its advance. And so I think that opens the door even without negotiations with anyone on the Kurdish side or on the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces side, which is not just Kurdish. It, it opens the door for reducing the level of violence and the humanitarian disaster in Syria. Um, even without negotiations. Uh, everybody is talking about the humanitarian issue and how Turkish military will be able to distinguish between who they deem a terrorist and who they deem a civilian. Uh, Turkey has had victims in the thousands over several decades um, at the hands of terrorism, uh, particularly uh, Kurdish terrorism, as has been supported by various monitoring groups and Turkish statistics by various governments, not just Erdogan's. So really, it is a. we understand your point of view, yet there is a fear that the, the, the public at large, the Kurdish public at large, are in danger. Is, is that understood in Istanbul, in Ankara and across Turkey? Uh, it, it's, it's a very salient point. In fact, uh, thank you for raising uh, uh, this, this matter. Uh, from the very beginning, the Turkish uh, government made it clear that that they are not fighting the Kurds, but they are fighting we, uh, YPG uh, uh, and and PKK's affiliated organizations. Uh, the Kurds are our uh, our, our brothers and sisters. We have lived uh, for uh, over a thousand years side by side, and nobody in Turkey, in fact, can uh, can argue that he's pure Turkish or uh, of, of Turkish origin or of or of Kurdish origin. We all mix together. Uh, and uh, and we are Turkey and the Turkish people. So uh, so we are not against the Turkish operate, operations is not against uh, the Kurds as it is. Unfortunately, the Western media has has argued that that we are fighting to Kur the Kurds. It's misinformation and it is misrepresentation. Uh, what we what we agreed with the United States, uh, the two the two states, or the, the pres two presidents agreed on the scope uh, of the operation. And the Turkish president, in fact, made it clear probably last night that 
that if YPG and other terrorist organizations would 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 move beyond the uh, scope of the operation, beyond the 30, uh, 30 or 32 kilometers uh, to the south of M4, the, the road, uh, the highway called M4. Uh, so there will be no problem. So they will be establishing the, safe gr the safety zone uh, and establish the necessary infrastructure. So it is, uh, but unfortunately, we are not on the same page with the United States because the United States has their own, probably the United States has its own priorities in the Middle East. We respect, and we said on every uh, occasion that Turkey respects the territorial integrity and political unity of Syria, and uh, uh, and uh, and and what is happening in the uh, in the eastern side of the Euphrates is that, with the help of the United States and President Trump, made it clear that we they are providing weapons and they are providing finance and they are financing the YPG and the SDF. So they are creating uh, an army. They are arming 80,000, 60,000 to 80,000 people, providing them with equipment and military and training them. And also YPG is indoctrinating uh, their, their people. And also they are doing, they are engaged in serious ethnic cleansing. They are changing the demography of this region. So it's totally unacceptable for Turkey and for the Syrians. Okay, if that's the so case that- For Syria. If that and is now- yeah. So, sorry, so if that's the case then with Turkey yeah. and their position that you can't work with the US, I want to bring in uh, Ranj Aladin then. Of course, Turkey does believe that it can work alongside the Russians. They have found a way, for example, to uh, or a level of understanding, which is why the Russian president is now inviting Erdogan over to Sochi on October the 22nd. Russia's not entirely pleased, though, is it, with Operation Peace Spring? So one wonders what sort of influence or conversation these two leaders are going to have? Well, actually, I would uh, argue that it's to the contrary. Russia is, in fact, in a much stronger position now uh, because not only is Moscow uh, and the Assad regime now much closer to recapturing all the territories they lost during this civil war, but they've also effectively now forced the Americans out. So whatever cards uh, the U.S. had, and by default, whatever cards the uh, the Turkish government had as a result of the US presence has been lost. The only two things that Turkey and Russia had in common was forcing the Americans out and linked to that was ending the Kurdish state building project in northeast Syria. So that common ground for the two countries has in fact disappeared or is disappearing. And I think Turkey might find itself in a much weaker position in the coming months, even years, uh, as a result of this. The US uh, but also the fact that U.S. Uh, no, uh, aligned non-state actors like the YPG, SDF and other groups constituted a very effective buffer against the regime, but also leverage. So I think although Turkey might achieve some short-term objectives, in the longer run, it's most certainly Moscow and the Assad regime that stand to gain from this. Okay. I yeah. So, Ambassador Rende, can I just bring you in here then? Uh, how do you see that relationship between... Ankara and Moscow and this meeting on October the 22nd? Well, I, I agree with, uh, with, with, with our friend, uh, uh, the previous speaker, that, uh, that uh, R Russia uh, has gained uh, much and they are, play they are playing it very well. They, they have their own strategies, of course, uh, and they managed to, to engage uh, with every party during this proxy war, this terrible, bloody war. Um, war. Uh, and they managed to keep uh, uh, to keep talking with everybody in the context of the Astana uh, process with Turkey and Iran, with the uh, with the uh, with the Syrian government. Of course, uh, they managed to speak with uh, with non-state actors. Also, they played it very well, I must admit. And now, of course, uh, on the 23rd of October, uh, the president, the Turkish president Erdogan, will be visiting Sochi to meet uh, with President Putin. Uh, and uh, in fact, the Syrian representative, Russian Syrian representative Laurentiev is in town today. So they are courting the Turkish side and trying to, uh, to play it well. And uh, of course, they would like to, uh, to uh, uh, probably, they, they, would, they would like to pursue their own policies and their own priorities. But in this regard, they, made, uh, they, they achieved a great deal by bringing together, for example, the Syrian government and YPG uh, in Al Humaymin uh, uh, Air Base, uh, mm. I think yesterday uh, or the day before, the day before, and uh, and to try, they tried to forge an alliance and to guarantee that that the Kurds 
uh, if they side with the Syrian government, uh, 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 then they will have a certain degree of autonomy. Yeah. But nobody promised the YPG, like the Western side, uh, a kind of statelet. Because, you see, it, it's a kind of, uh, if you create a, a Kurdish autonomous region uh, uh, in, in northeastern Syria, then you are creating further uh, instabilities. This is, this is a source of instability. I understand that our American friends are trying to do their, uh, to pursue their own policies and trying to contain Iran because Iran is, uh, is, is considered to be the political objective uh, uh, to contain Iran and to, to create this autonomous Kurdish Republic. But this is going to destabilize the region as a whole. And it is, it is, it is okay. also uh, a kind of a big threat to the sovereignty and territor territorial integrity of, of Syria. And also, uh, me, YPG to, has, uh, has me, its own agenda. Indeed. Let me just come in there, uh, Ambassador. There's still a lot more to cover. We have very little time. I just want to bring in um, a, a piece of information for our viewers, which, and we'll go back to David Pollock in a moment. I mean, while President Trump has been inconsistent with his stance on Turkey, other US politicians have been strong on theirs. I want to express my gratitude to the Kurds. Uh, they were great fighters. Yeah, we had a terrific alliance with them. To rely on Russia and Iran to protect us against the rise of ISIS is, quite frankly, insane. Uh, David Pollock, the heat certainly is on uh, President Trump for his stance on, on, on and as you heard there from uh, Lindsey Gray uh, and Marcus Rubio, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. I mean, basically, US politicians are, are playing with a lot of, uh, juggling a lot of balls, aren't they? How to defend the Kurds and also worrying about uh, ISIL prisoners being released. It's a worry most probably in Ankara and across most of the European capitals as well. It is a worry. Uh, I actually think that the various parties have their own self-interest in making sure, or at least trying to make sure, that ISIS does not rejuvenate inside Syria, because it's a threat to their own control. Whether we're talking about the Assad regime, or Iran, or Russia, or Turkey at this stage, so I am not as concerned about the resurgence of ISIS inside Syria as some other analysts or some of the American politicians. However, I am concerned about the resurgence of the Syrian regime and of its Russian and especially Iranian and Hezbollah allies inside Syria. And I think if we're going to see ethnic cleansing, it's not okay. so much by the Turks or the Kurds, okay. it's by the Assad regime and okay. its Russian and Iranian patrons. If that is a scenario, then Ranj Aladin, we're, we're rapidly uh, finishing our, our program soon. I mean, what's your reaction to that? I mean, what are the main priorities when you look at the bigger picture of uh, Operation uh, Peace Spring in terms of the wider picture I in the region? Well, I think, uh, as we've just heard, it's a real distraction from the, uh, the, the main issue here, and that is the Assad regime, which is the actor that has killed, maimed half a million people, dis displaced millions of its own people. Uh, and I think the YPG forms part of that equation. Uh, if we're talking about the need to have an environment that is conducive to the rule of law, that prevents ethnic cleansing, uh, it's not so much armed groups, terrorist actors like ISIS that might present a problem in the longer run. It's in fact the Assad regime. And I think here's where the real crisis and tragedy is because the US and Turkey could have gone about this problem in a much more uh, effective, much more constructive manner. Ultimately, uh, if not anything else, it could have established an alternative security arrangement structure in the Northeast that could have uh, that, that, that could have uh, prevented us from being in this current uh, scenario uh, in, in the country. And it is the Assad regime, it is the Iranians and the Russians that will be empowered. Well, it's interesting to see uh, your final thoughts on that. And of course, it is a subject that we will continue to return to. Uh, there's never enough time to uh, hit all the bases, but I think we've certainly covered it enough for our international audience. Ranj Aladdin in Doha, Mithat Rendi in Istanbul, and David Pollock in Maryland. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time here on Al Jazeera. And thank you for watching as well. Uh, you can, of course, see the programme again here anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can of course join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at 
AJ Inside Story from Issa Hill Rahman and the Inside Story team. Thanks very much for your time and your company.